In this final video, we're going to discuss a process known as PESL analysis. And PESL analysis can be used to determine whether a project is viable or not. In the previous videos, we've looked at a number of different factors which influence the uptake of renewables, but this particular tool can be used to assess all of those different factors. Now the P in PESL stands for political. So when you conduct a PESL analysis, it's important to consider all of the political factors that can potentially affect your project. And I've listed a couple of examples there. You might look at international agreements. We had the Kyoto Protocol as an example. You might look at different incentive schemes. So we spoke about contracts for difference and the like. And you might look at different policies and different taxes that might impact on your project. So you would need to consider all of the political factors that may shape the outcome of your given project. The E in PESL stands for economical or economic factors. So this might include things such as cost projections and income projections. Again, you might start to consider different grants that are available for your project or different taxes that may impact on its development. More generally, you might consider the impact that your project's going to have on the economy. Is it going to create jobs as an example, or impact on the economy in other ways? The S in PESL stands for social, and again I've just included a few examples of what this might include. You might consider public opinions. Are people going to object to your project? Once again you might consider job creation. Here we're more concerned with the impacts on society. How is this project going to impact on the people in the surrounding regions? The T in PESL stands for technological. So the things that are likely to impact on a renewable energy development, as an example, are any advances in technology. I'll give you an example. Until recently, all wind turbines have needed a gearbox. More recently, wind turbines that are being developed are what's called direct drive, which means they don't have a requirement for a gearbox. Now what this means is that there's been a reduction in the amount of maintenance that's required and as a result the costs of downtime have been reduced. So that's an example of how technological developments might influence the outcome of a project. We might also see improvements in efficiencies of machines over time. The L in PESL stands for legal or legislation and we've mentioned a few examples such as the Climate Change Act and we've also mentioned some of the renewables legislation, such as contracts for difference. So it's important to consider all of the different legislation that impacts on the project. And the final E in PESL stands for environmental. And I've placed this at the top because this is a huge driver for renewables projects. Climate change, fossil fuel reserves, and also during the development stage, we have our environmental impact assessment. Now I want to give you an example of how this tool can be beneficial to identify some potential conflicts of interest that a given project or given development may have. So for this example we're going to look at two different projects. We're going to consider a wind farm development and we're also going to consider a gas development. CCGT stands for Combined Cycle Gas Turbines. So this is the burning of gas to produce electricity. And I've listed our different factors down the left hand side. Political, economical, social, technological, legal and environmental. Now we're going to look at each of these elements but we're actually going to look at them out of sequence. And the reason we're going to do this is because it will highlight the problem of overlooking these sorts of tools. Using these types of tools ensures that we consider a broad range of factors. So the first one that we're going to consider here is economical. And this is to do with cost and income projections. So first of all for the wind farm, we've seen that onshore wind farms have an average levelised cost of electricity. It's not the cheapest, but it's not the most expensive. Whereas in the present day, combined cycle gas turbines have a low levelised cost of electricity. They're cheaper to develop. If we consider incentives, we know that if we develop a wind farm, we have contracts for difference available to support our project. But our gas burning plant also receives government subsidies. And both our wind farm and our gas plant support economic growth. It would provide jobs, but it would also provide security of energy supply. So next, 
let's consider social. Now again, both of our projects would create jobs and would probably be seen favourably by the surrounding areas. And as we mentioned, both would help to secure the supply of electricity. Now for wind farms, I've said that the impact of that would be average, whereas for our gas plant, the impact of that would be good. And the reason for that is because wind energy is less predictable. Yes, it would provide security of supply, but would we be able to produce energy as and when we needed it? The difference with gas is when demand goes up, we burn more gas, we produce more electricity. And when demand goes down, we can reduce the amount of gas we're burning. So in actual fact, the gas plant is likely to improve security of supply more than our wind farm. Now, if we were to look at those two things in isolation, it would be very difficult to separate the two. As an investor, would we prefer to invest in the wind farm or would we prefer to invest in the gas burning plant? So if we're purely considering income and the economy and job creation, then we have a more difficult decision to make. The same can be said when we introduce technological advancements, because both of these technologies are going to evolve and improve. So still, we have a difficult decision to make. So it isn't until we consider the environmental impacts that our decisions may sway in favour of one or other project. In terms of the wind farm, we know that the wind is a renewable energy source. But the gas is a finite energy source. The gas is eventually going to run out and the cost of extracting the gas is also likely to increase. We know that our wind farm isn't going to produce CO2 emissions, whereas our gas burning plant does produce carbon dioxide. Now again, you'd be right to question whether that's a huge issue because we know that we still have sufficient reserves for the life cycle of our plant. And the advantage of gas over coal is that it produces less CO2 than the burning of coal. So from an ethical standpoint, it's still difficult to make a decision. So let's consider the legal implications. We know that if we develop a wind farm, we're entitled to contracts for difference. So we can accurately predict how much income we're going to produce. Now, our gas burning plant will also receive subsidies, but it's also going to be subjected to the additional tax from carbon price support. And although that level may currently be fixed at, say, 8 to 10 percent, the likelihood is that the percentage of that tax could increase as pressures increase to reduce carbon dioxide further. So it's somewhat of an unknown. And finally, if we consider our political factors, we know that there's a pressure to uptake renewables and we know that there's a pressure to reduce carbon dioxide. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have a place for gas, but it does mean that the production of electricity from gas may be subjected to more scrutiny in the future, or it may be subjected to higher levies and higher taxes. One of the real challenges is that it's difficult to make those predictions. Whereas one thing we can be certain of, the need for renewable energy sources is always going to be increasing. We're always going to be looking for ways of generating clean renewable energy. Now what we've done there is by no means a comprehensive pestle analysis, but what it does serve to highlight is that these tools can identify potential conflicts within these different areas of political, economical, social, technological, legal and environmental. And without these types of tools, and without considering the broader range of factors, it's difficult to make an informed decision about which technologies should and which technologies shouldn't be developed as we move into the future.